audiophiles hate the center channel. This is a typical center channel speaker, and it's designed wrong. They just kind of suck. I mean, let's be real. The idea that horizontal center channels like this suck is everywhere in audiophile lore. I've heard some bad ones. I mean, have you ever struggled to hear the dialogue in a movie? A bad center channel speaker could be to blame. But if horizontal center channel speakers suck, why do people keep buying them? Are they really that bad? In this video, I'm gonna design and build three different center channels. Two classic horizontal centers, each with their own twist, and this three-way beast featuring this dome mid-range. By the end of this video, you'll know if a horizontal center channel suits you and what to look out for when you buy, design, or build one. In popular audio culture, people say that a horizontal center channel like this only sounds right if you sit bang on in the middle. Move off to the side and the sound falls apart. To show what I mean, I'm gonna use this speaker as an example. This is the Glow 4C. Basically a center channel I designed to go with the Glow 4 bookshelf speaker. It's pretty simple, it's just two woofers placed horizontally with a dome tweeter right between them. This is a pretty common recipe for a center channel speaker. If you want to see how I designed and built this speaker, check out my videos on the Illuminate 7 and the mid 90s. The process is pretty much exactly the same. If I take a gated measurement of this speaker, which eliminates room reflections straight on, we get a reasonably flat response. But if I turn the speaker just 20 degrees, and so the measurement is now at a slight angle, there's a huge hole in the mid-range. The mid-range is where most of the dialogue lives, so having a huge hole there is a big problem. At least on paper, but we'll get to that. To understand what's happening, we really need to look at a horizontal contour plot. If you haven't seen one of these before, left to right is frequency, bass, mids, and treble. The center line is you sitting straight in front of the speaker, as you move up or down, you're basically moving left or right off axis from the speaker. And then color is important. Red is really loud, whereas blue is quiet. Here's what a great contour plot looks like. As you move off to the side, the speaker gets quieter but keeps the same tonal balance. This is actually from Purifier's SPK16 reference speaker, an incredible design which I'm going to cover in another video. Now here's the contour plot for the Glow 4C. On axis, it's fine. Even 10 degrees off axis, it's okay. But when we hit 20 degrees, you can really see that mid-range dip. Plenty of people are just gonna yell comb filtering as soon as they see this, but I think there's a little bit more to the story than that. If we place two drivers side by side in this simple wave simulator, link in the description, you can see the classic comb filtering pattern. But if we drop the frequency low enough, the two drivers couple together, effectively working as one driver. This seems like an obvious fix, right? I mean, all we need to do is set the crossover frequency to the tweeter below the frequency where the woofers comb filter. Problem solved, right? Well, let's test that. This is the Illuminate 4C, the compact center channel I designed for the Illuminate series. Its tweeter has a much larger rear chamber than the one used in the Glow series, so I can cross it over much lower. The crossover used in the Glow 4C is about 2.7 kilohertz. This is about 1.8. Measured on axis, the response is pretty flat. And 20 degrees off axis, still looking pretty good. But if we measure at 40 degrees, same issue. Big hole in the mid-range. And to be clear, this is not comb filtering. We can see a little bit of comb filtering on the Glow 4C, but for the Illuminate 4C, it looks pretty clean apart from that mid-range narrowing. If we think back to our wave simulation, we can remember when the woofers are playing a low enough frequency, they work together like one woofer, which is great, except for one problem, beaming. At low frequencies with long wavelengths, a speaker has a really wide radiation pattern. But as frequency increases and wavelength shrinks to about the diameter of the driver, the radiation pattern narrows like a laser beam. We can estimate what frequency this happens by using this formula. Notice diameter is on the bottom of the fraction. On their own, these drivers are about seven centimeters wide, so they beam at about 3.1 kilohertz, but arrayed together like this, they're effectively 28 centimeters wide, so they beam at about 780 hertz, which is not good. Most tweeters don't sound good playing this low, and we could stick a full range driver in the middle of these two woofers and use that as a tweeter, but it's governed by the same physics, so it'll just beam in the treble instead of the mids. 
If you're still set on a horizontal center channel, the only real solution to beaming is to use a mid-range under the tweeter. And that's what we're gonna build next. Adding a dome mid-range does complicate things. It's easy to see them as sort of like tweeters, but for mids, and they sort of are, except for one thing, they're huge. This is the compact tweeter I'm using in the Glow series. This is the tweeter I'm using in the Illuminate series with the tuned rear chamber. This is a four inch woofer. And then this is the dome mid-range. It's huge, just look at it. Getting good off-axis response necessitates that I have the tweeter stacked on top of the mid-range like this. And the fact that I have to surround it with two big seven inch woofers like this means that this is turning into the biggest 3D printed speaker I've ever built. Even though I'm printing the speaker in two halves, I have to modify the printer with a little 3D printed piece in order to access the full volume and fit the parts inside it. I didn't film the builds for the previous two center channels because frankly, they weren't very interesting, but this one is going to be a nightmare. So grab some popcorn. After modifying the printer, I printed these prototype pieces. These took six days to print and a little over five kilos of filament. So <laughs> I hope this works first go. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> Okay, so it's a few days later. I don't know what it is about filming, but as soon as I turn the camera on, all my common sense seems to just disappear. Before I can glue the two enclosure halves together, I have to run all the wires through to the proper spots for each of the speaker drivers. But clearly I wasn't thinking because I ran a bunch of the wires over the top of these speaker braces. That might seem fine until you realize there's identical bracing on the other enclosure half and these two need to fit together. It's obviously not gonna work if there's a bunch of wires in the way. I didn't have a rag handy, so I just used a bit of paper to try wipe up as much glue as I could. So hopefully the enclosure halves fit together still because if not, I'm gonna have to file all the glue off. It was a bit of a faff, but it's together. It probably would have been a little bit easier if I soldered the mid and the tweeter on at the end rather than having them hang out the front the whole time. But look, real men play on hard mode. Now, all I gotta do is screw these drivers in, take some measurements and design the crossover. Well, at least I thought so, but it never ends. I didn't allow space for the spade connectors so the driver doesn't fit. So time to get dremeling. That's better. All right, so the crossover's done. For a three-way speaker with two woofers, it turned out to be pretty simple. Nothing too fancy, no notch filters, just some high pass and low pass filters, plus a resistor to bring the tweeter down a bit. This chaotic mess is the prototype crossover. And in case you're wondering, yes, this does melt my brain assembling these but it's measuring pretty well and sounding pretty good. So I think we're ready to print the final speaker. Although we do have another six days of printing ahead of us. And boom, movie magic, it's done. This speaker may be gigantic, but the results speak for themselves. We have about 60 degrees of coverage through the vocal range and the directivity only starts narrowing as the tweeter starts to beam. Pretty convincing, right? Well, it would be if it wasn't for the fact that all of the measurements I've shown you up to this point have nothing to do with how we listen to speakers in rooms. That's because they were all anechoic. Let me show you what I mean. These are my movie night friends, Diego and Hannah. We're about to watch the new season of Love, Death and Robots, and I'm sneaking in a quick experiment. First, we'll watch an episode with the Glow 4C aimed right at us and see what they think. All right, dialogue clarity. Nine. Eight. Dynamics. Ten. I'd say ten for also. Timber. Mahogany. <laughs> <laughs> ten. Was it ten? Yeah. 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 Okay. Next, I'll point the speaker so it faces off to the side. Remember, the off-axis measurements show a big dip in the mid-range, so on paper, this should sound worse. Okay, wait. It's changed. No, no. Different speaker. <laughs> It's, I've turned it slightly. All right, dialogue clarity. Uh, 10. Dynamics. 10. 
Timber. Tim. Yeah, Timber, turn them all. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty much. You were happy. Tens all around, yeah. Was it just because the speaker was facing me? Yeah, maybe because it's facing it at you. I think we're also getting more reflections off that wall. It's bouncing back yeah. to me or something. Yeah. You would think having the speaker pointed off to the side would like ruin it, wouldn't you? Yeah. It was clearer for me. Yeah, and the other one's sitting closest to the wall, so that would <laughs> yeah. make sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it was good. Shockingly, Hannah and Diego actually like the sideways setup better. Some audiophiles might scoff at this, but that's the point. Non-audiophiles skip the bullshit and just tell you what they hear, and that can be incredibly valuable. In this case, what they're saying actually aligns with our current scientific understanding of psychoacoustics. Humans are highly adapted to listening to sound in rooms. The early reflections can actually increase speech intelligibility. If you're listening to a speaker in an anechoic chamber, you only hear each sound once directly from the speaker. In a normally reflective room, you get the direct sound from the speaker, plus all the individual reflections from the walls and the ceiling. Your brain gathers information from every single one of these reflections and then adds it to the direct sound, increasing clarity. My lounge room only has one side wall, so pointing the speaker at it increases the magnitude of the reflections, which may be why they heard a clarity increase. This will shift the phantom image though, so I wouldn't recommend you do this in your setup. Turning the speaker didn't seem to affect the timber or tonal quality either. To show you why, I've got another quick test for you. I've set the Glowfall C up here at the front of my room, just like you would in a home theater. And then I've got a measurement mic at the other end of the room standing in for somebody watching a movie. When we measure the in-room response, we get a heap of grass, but our hearing is highly adapted to listening to sound in small rooms, so we can filter that out. With psychoacoustic smoothing applied, we can see the response is quite flat. Now let's turn the speaker 40 degrees, simulating someone sitting way off to the side. Remember that big hole in the mid-range? Surprise, surprise, it's gone. And even at 60 degrees, where you could barely see the screen, it's still looking reasonably flat. So what's going on here? Well, let's take a look at how speakers behave in small rooms. Now, this is crucial. Picture a concert hall with a bookshelf speaker on the stage. Up on the stage, in front of the speaker, the direct sound dominates because the walls and ceiling are very far away. Move 50 meters back and the direct sound drops by six decibels for every doubling of distance. We can't hear the direct sound from the speaker anymore, but we can hear the reflections. Back here, the reflections dominate. The interesting bit is in the middle ground, where the direct sound and the reflections mix. We hear both. Your lounge room lives entirely in that middle zone. Whether you're listening to near field monitors on your desk or a center channel across the room, you can't escape hearing both direct sound and reflections. The room's just too small. Interesting, right? This is why competent designers always prioritize in-room response over razor flat on-axis response. For the Glow 4C, I even nudged the on-axis mid-range up a little bit to straighten out that in-room response. Of course, there is a compromise. Wide directivity is key to apparent soundstage width and that feeling of envelopment with sound. If you want room filling sound, you need wide directivity. But a horizontal MTM like this is not the disaster audiophile folklore would tell you. Every speaker has its compromises. You want something practical and compact? Build a horizontal MTM like this. If you're unwilling to compromise on sound and have the space, build a three-way sender channel, or honestly, you could just use a bookshelf speaker. If you'd like to see what it takes to build some of these speakers yourself, the build guides are available for free at printyourspeakers.com. And to make things a little bit more accessible, the Fiddly Bits kits are now shipping for free worldwide. Next video, I'm building a portable Bluetooth speaker, so like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.